Hi everybody, I hope that you're all doing really well. So today I am back to talk about the books that I read in the first half of November. So of course November is famous on booktube for being non-fiction November in which we try to read as many non-fiction books as humanly possible or you know just generally upping the amount of non-fiction books that you read especially if you barely read any at all. And whilst once again this month has been a little bit of a slower reading month and I haven't read quite as many books as I would like to, I'm, I'm quite pleased to say that I have read majority non-fiction even though you know it's been two. It's also been a bit of an interesting reading month in that of the three books I've read, two of them I feel like I don't really have much to say about them. Which is kind of an odd sensation but I do feel like I kind of bat backwards and forwards between having books where I'm just like oh my god I have so much to say about this, I could very very easily go on a rant about this or go on a gushing fest about this. And then there are other books where I'm very much like yep that was a book and that's all I've got to say about it. I feel like the book that really epitomises that feeling for this month was On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. Arguably Charles Darwin's most famous and influential piece of writing in which he puts forth his theories on natural selection. This is one of those books that of course I'd always wanted to read the whole thing off because you know it is so influential. And whilst I'm really glad that I have finally gotten round to reading the whole thing, you know I'd read snippets of it here and there especially during my history degree, my, my overwhelming thought was just yeah, that is a book. This is the thing that I have read now, yay. You know, I wouldn't say it's necessarily enjoyable or of any literary merit, but you know, I'm glad I read it. You know, if you are somebody who wants to read historically significant works, if you want to read the most influential texts of all time, then of course you have to read this. But you know, if you are solely into reading for enjoyment factor, then maybe skip this, I don't know. I feel like I spent a good chunk of reading this feeling like, ah oh, yes, this is why I didn't do science for A-level, unless you count psychology. I don't know why it is that whenever my brain encounters anything that is even remotely scientific my brain just goes mm -mm, no no not today. I wish I wasn't this way but it's, it's just how my brain works. I feel like the parts with this where I really started to perk up and started to be like mm, yes yes we're getting into the good stuff um, was when um, Darwin was really arguing his point and really defending logically why it is that his theory of evolution and his theory of natural selection is the correct one rather than the previous sections which were very much here is all of my evidence. You know when he was taking the counter arguments to his claims and what other people might be arguing against him and then rebutting them. I found that to be the most gripping, is that the right word? I don't know. Next up I've got The Watchmaker of Filigree Street by Natasha Pulley. This book is set in the 1880s in Victorian London. We initially follow the character of Nathaniel Steepleton who works at the home office, who one night goes back to his lodgings and finds a pocket watch on his bed. No note attached to it, no evidence of where it came from. And Nathaniel thinks nothing of it until six months later when this watch saves his life. One day a previously unheard alarm goes off on the pocket watch watch, Thaniel takes the watch outside to work out what to do with it and how to turn it off when a bomb goes off in the building that he was just in. And so there lies the mystery. Where did this watch come from and who gave it to Thaniel and why? Thaniel decides to find out who it was who made this watch and goes straight to the source. And through this investigation Thaniel ends up meeting the watchmaker Kate Amori and the two of them start to develop a close bond despite the fact that Thaniel doesn't necessarily know whether or not he should trust him. At the same time we also follow the character of Grace Caro, a young intelligent woman who has previously been working at Oxford but who has been told by her family that she has to give up her dreams of being a scientist in order to marry, as of course was the expectation for women in this time period. This is a book that I kind of had mixed feelings off. I think what really shines in this is really the characters and particularly the camaraderie between these characters. I think Natasha Polly really excels in writing the conversations between each of these characters. They feel very very real. Something that is explored through this book is the experience of immigrants within Victorian London, uh, particularly Kate Amori who is Japanese. A moment that I quite enjoyed was that first scene where Thaniel meets Kate Amori. And something that I quite liked was that Natasha Pulley didn't shy away from the fact that whilst Nathaniel is, you know, genuinely a good character and he is a kind person, he's also like a typical Victorian man. <laughs> and he is rather ignorant of Japanese culture and what it is like to be an immigrant in Britain. And that whole first interaction is Natasha Pulley kind of dunking on Thaniel for being so ignorant. The first time that Maury introduces himself and gives him his name, Thaniel kind of stops for a moment and has to be like oh can you say that again even though his name is very easy to pronounce and the narrator goes as far as to say it was a simple sound but knowing that it was Japanese and therefore difficult his brain had refused to hear it properly and is that not just every English person hearing a name that isn't English for the first time that because an English person knows that a name that they are hearing is foreign their brain just goes mm -mm, not registering it no no I quite like that she didn't pull her punches <laughs> however what I thought was a bit weaker on this was some of the plotting and pacing I know I definitely heard other people talking about how you know the pacing was a little bit all over the place like it got very very slow in the middle and then sped up rapidly uh, 
towards the end to the point where it does get a little confusing as to what's going on and what people's motives are. There is also what I would argue is a bit of a sudden shift in the dynamic of one of the relationships within this book that I, 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 I just felt like I was missing something and I genuinely felt like maybe I should go back and reread this book because I I didn't see a certain relationship coming and once again I checked to see what other people had said and there were some people who were like oh yeah I saw that coming from a mile away and other people who were like no that just suddenly shifted and I didn't know which for a book where largely the character relationships and dynamics were really really strong like it felt like it was an issue with the pacing and the plotting rather than with the characters themselves. It just kind of felt like a chapter had been missed somewhere and I'd completely skipped over it. I would say that if you are interested in like mix of historical fiction, kind of steampunk elements and a bit of magical realism, then this will definitely be for you. For me, there were definitely aspects of this that I really, really liked and then others that I was kind of Ugh. on. So not my personal favorite, but glad that I picked it up. And then the third and final book that I read in this half of November was The Day the World Came to Town, 9-11 in Gander, Newfoundland by Jim Defeedy. And this genuinely feels like the book that came to save this wrap up because I loved it so much. For those of you who are familiar with the music come from away, you'll be very familiar with this story of how after the attacks at the Twin Towers and the Pentagon during 9-11, US airspace was closed and the decision was taken to divert all of the planes that were currently meant to be going into the US to other places, which included Gander in Newfoundland. Gander in Newfoundland had historically been used as a refueling stop for planes that were making transatlantic flights. However, as jets and planes had started to be able to make longer haul flights, it had started to become much less used. However, it's very, very large runway became the perfect place to divert dozens of planes carrying thousands of passengers. However, of course, this meant that the small town of Gander, with a population of around about 9,000 people, suddenly had to accommodate between six and 7,000 passengers. And this book basically tells a story of how the citizens of Newfoundland basically welcomed these stranded passengers with open arms, and really pays tribute to the way that these people came together despite the trauma and the tragedy of the day. But the book does not shy away from the fact that strategically and emotionally, this was so difficult to accomplish. When you stop and think about what it takes to accommodate for thousands of people from all over the world, like logistically, it was a nightmare. Organising food, drink, entertainment, shelter, showering facilities, medication, looking after any animals that were on board, catering for people's physical and mental well-being, for their religious well-being, the amount of anxiety and distrust that people were feeling as a result of the 9-11 attacks. Early on in the book, Jim Defeedy talks about the experiences of the pilots who were hearing about what had happened in New York and suddenly being confronted with what if you are another one of these planes? What if you are harboring a terrorist and you don't know? There's a point in part right at the end of a chapter where one of the pilots was realizing, there are no locks on my doors. I am not in control if somebody tries to take over this plane. Pilots having to make the decision not to tell their passengers that they are going to be redirecting their plane to Gander until the very last minute, just in case there happens to be terrorists on board. There was so much anxiety, so much distrust, which makes what happens next so much more poignant because the citizens of Newfoundland technically did not need to do everything that they did. They supplied clothes, food, toilet roll, um, medication, childcare, entertainment. These people were up 24 seven, making sure that these thousands of passengers were accommodated for. The residents of the town would invite people round to their houses just to have a few minutes peace to themselves or to take a shower. When it was found out that there were a plane full of children who had been planning to go to Disneyland, they decided to get all dressed up in Disney princess costumes to play music for them and to do games. The amount of kindness that they showed was not because it was ordered, it was just what you do. That is just the spirit of Newfoundland to be welcoming and accommodating and accepting of anybody who comes at your door. I honestly don't feel like I'm doing this story and this book justice at all. Just know that, oh my God, it absolutely five stars. One of my favorite books that I've read this year. And I may or may not have cried when we got to the epilogue. The one and only caveat that I could give for this is that this book was published, um, I believe it went into print 2002 and then was published in 2003, which means of course that you're only getting the story a year on. Whereas if you're familiar with the musical Come From Away and all of the stories from then, you'll know that that these relationships lasted so much longer than just a year later. The kindness that was shown, the bonds that were formed between the citizens of Ganda and the plain people, as they were called, lasted for years afterwards and are still continuing to this day. And of course, you can't quite get the sense of that for a book that was only published a year later. It makes me really, really keen to pick up more nonfiction from this event. I particularly got my eye on Channel of Peace by Kevin Turriff, who was one of the stranded passengers who arrived in Ganda and who was featured in the musical. And yes, yes, I do have my 
come from away pin just you know to commemorate this book it's just such a heartwarming story in the midst of so much tragedy it just reaffirms your faith in humanity and in people's kindness in terms of what i'm currently reading right now i am partway through troy by stephen fry the follow-up in his greek myth retellings following up heroes and mythos and is just as funny and witty as ever i'm also getting very very close to the end of a poem for every autumn day but of course this will only be finished at the end of november and yeah that is everything that i have read in november and i'm currently reading do let me know how you were getting on with non-fiction november or any other books that you've been reading this month i'd love to hear from you i hope you're having a fantastic fantastic day and i look forward to talking to you again soon thanks bye